It's complicated because it mimics Alzheimer's, it mimics Parkinson's, and it mimics psychiatric disorders. And so the big difference is when you have Alzheimer's, it is this very slow and steady descent. When you have Lewy body, it is peppered with fluctuations. And so one day, the person that is your beloved will absolutely know who you are, be 100% who he is. And the next day, he will not know who you are. Welcome to Brainstorm by Us Against Alzheimer's, a patient-centered nonprofit organization. Your host, Meryl Comer, is a co-founder, 24-year caregiver, an Emmy Award-winning journalist, and the author of the New York Times bestseller, Slow Dancing with a Stranger. This is Brainstorm, and I'm Meryl Comer with our continuing series on Breaking Through Silence and Stigma. Our focus today is on Lewy body dementia, the second most progressive form of dementia after Alzheimer's, impacting 1 million individuals in the U.S. Symptoms typically present at age 50 or older appear to affect slightly more men than women and are often confused with Alzheimer's disease. What they share in common, there is no cure. Our guest today is Mary Lou Falcone, classical music publicist, performer, educator, and author of I Didn't See It Coming, Scenes of Love, Loss, and Lewy Body Dementia. Welcome, Mary Lou. Great to have you. Thank you, Meryl. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Mary Lou, you could have easily written a book about your collaboration with celebrated classical artists that you've mentored like Van Cliburn, Renee Fleming, even James Taylor. Instead, your memoir is a very personal journey through Lewy body dementia with your husband, Nikki Zen, a 50s rock and roll musician who became a world-renowned cartoonist, illustrator, and painter. Describe for me your husband at the top of his artistic career and your storied life together. At the top of Nikki's career, he was, as you mentioned, a very celebrated artist. His work hangs in the Victorian Albert Museum in London. He was said to be the inspiration for Roy Lichtenstein, and um, those are pretty heady things. But above all, Nicky was a great human being who, with his art, touched many, many people. But more than that, he was a person who embraced life, embraced art, embraced fellow human beings. And that's the Nikki that, that I just, I miss. Music was central to both your lives. And with what researchers now know about how the brain responds to music, did it mask early symptoms? Oh, huh, that's a very good question. I think that Nikki's energy is what masked early symptoms. He was determined. He was a very physically fit person. He was also mentally very agile. And so I think that what happened was that he compensated a lot in the early stages. So that what I was looking at, when I would see him forget things, or I would see him stumble a little bit, or I'd see him get slightly angry, which he was not an angry person at all, I would think about it and slightly suggest something, but I didn't dwell on it. And he then would hop to and mask whatever was happening. And then in 2016, the fall of 2016, I was noticing these things that I just mentioned. By the end of that year, we were in Vienna for the New Year's concert of the Vienna Philharmonic because Gustavo Dudamel, who was my client at the time, was conducting there. And the Vienna Philharmonic was also my client. So I had a double header and we happily were there. From there, we went on to Paris. And in Paris, he had what I didn't know. One night, he had a heart attack but I didn't know that's what it was. Coming back stateside in early January, went to a cardiologist. They determined that he absolutely had had a heart attack, could only determine what needed to be done by angiogram. And I thought, well, this is interesting because maybe this is what's causing this kind of erratic, strange behavior, not enough blood getting to the head. Sure enough, they did an angiogram and they found that three of the arteries were totally clogged. 99%, 100%, 80%, and the fourth one was 50% clogged. They immediately did open heart surgery, triple bypass surgery. But instead of getting better, Nikki kept getting worse. The hallucinations that had started with the heart surgery were, unbeknownst to me, continuing. 
way after the surgery. He was losing weight. Nikki was a very trim and slight person, and he couldn't afford to lose one more pound. He kept losing weight. He was not himself. Energy did not come back. All the things that the bypass surgery is supposed to address, none of it was addressed. And after waiting over a year for this to actually get better, we switched doctors. Then came the diagnosis eventually of Lewy body dementia. You say eventually came the diagnosis. Was he misdiagnosed? No, he was not. Basically, when we switched doctors, the doctor that we went to, of course, was starting from ground zero, basically. And he was very diligent. And after about four or five months from the beginning of our relationship together, I said to him, I really think we need a baseline MRI. And he said, well, you know, Mary Lou, Nikki is 73, and this could be just age factoring in, but let me watch it. And bless his heart, he watched for a month. And he came back to me and he said, I think you're right. I think we need to do a baseline MRI. And so in January of 2019, now remember the heart surgery was in February of 17. So this is almost two years later. They did the MRI and it showed a phrase that I completely think is useless, which is age appropriate deterioration. You know, I mean, that's code for we don't know what's happening, in my opinion. And so I said to our new physician, what next? This is not good enough. He was part of Sinai, Mount Sinai. He said, I'm going to send you to Columbia Presbyterian Hospital to the best neurologist I know. And I thought to myself, that's really strange because these folks always go within their own system. They don't send you externally. But we went to Columbia Presbyterian Hospital, and this was in mid-February of 2019, and they did a cognitive test. And Nikki loved to joke. And so when they were pointing to different things, you know, he would joke about it. And they got to the lion and said, and what is this? And he said, oh, that's simple. That's Mary Lou. Then the person administering the test went, oh my goodness. And I said, no, no, no. You have to understand. I'm a Leo. That's my birth sign. That's what he's referring to. So please, you know, Nikki, stop joking. This is serious. They did the test. They had him walk, you know, the usual walking pattern. And the doctor did come in and say, right off the top, this is Lewy body dementia with Parkinsonian aspects. And I just thought, whoa, all you've done is a cognitive test and you've watched him walk. I didn't say, are you sure? I just said, whoa, that's really interesting. And he said, but in order to support this diagnosis, we will do a DAT scan, which is like an MRI, but it's with a dye and it's, it's more involved. It's more invasive, intrusive. And uh, we'll do a REM sleep test because very often with Lewy body, the person who has it will be acting out in his sleep. And sure enough, both tests came back and actually did enhance what had been said. And so on March 1st of 2019, they definitively said it was Lewy body dementia with Parkinsonian aspects. When I went back to our doctor, our original doctor, he said, basically, I had a feeling that's what it was because my sister has it. Now, based on the symptoms you've just described, how typical is it that cardiovascular disease is connected with a medical condition like Lewy body dementia? It's only anecdotal from where I sit. I don't think this can be proven. But very often the question is asked after heart surgery, if there is a correlation between the anesthesia that is necessary for heart surgery and the hallucinations and then tying that to Lewy body dementia. Very often people who have had heart surgery and have Lewy body dementia see a pattern in this, as do I. It's complicated because it mimics Alzheimer's, it mimics Parkinson's, and it mimics psychiatric disorders. And so the big difference is when you have Alzheimer's, it is this very slow and steady descent. When you have Lewy body, it is peppered with fluctuations. And so one day, the person that is your beloved will absolutely know who you are, be 100% who he is. And the next day, he will not know who you are. But then it comes back again that he's fine. And these fluctuations are very frightening to the person going through it. They are frightening to watch from those of us who are the caregivers. And they sort of give false hope. 
You know, every once in a while you see your loved one back with you 100%. And it takes your breath away. But more importantly, the person who's going through it knows exactly what's happening to him. So was your husband self-aware of what was going on? Very much so. As a matter of fact, he wrote a poem about a month and a half or so before he died, describing his descent into Louis body dementia. And I didn't find it until three months after he passed. But when I found it, it took my breath away because it described so accurately what someone who's experiencing this is feeling. And everyone who's read it has just wept because Nikki knew exactly what was happening to him. Mary Lou, the public had no idea that comedian Robin Williams had suffered from Lewy body dementia until months after his suicide in 2014. In your book, you name other famous people who were initially diagnosed as suffering from Alzheimer's disease. Tell me why this disease is so complicated to diagnose. Well, the clear one between Lewy body and an Alzheimer's is hallucinations. Very early on, with Lewy body dementia, there are hallucinations. Not always. See, that's the stickler in all this. It is so mercurial, a disease, that you can't point to 10 symptoms and say, everybody will have these 10 symptoms. It just doesn't happen that way. So you kind of have to take an amalgam of what you're seeing and be your own detective in all of this, because it's not going to be found in a blood test. Even today, people will say, well, it's not definitive until autopsy. I find that a little bit hard to believe, very honestly. I mean, why would you give it a name if you don't know what it is? Listening to you describe this early part of your journey, what I hear is that it really demands persistence on the part of the loved one, the spouse, the adult child, if they're going to get to the bottom of what's happening. Absolutely. I think I referenced a little bit earlier, you have to be your own detective or you have to be the detective for the person that you adore and love. And I'm not a person who takes no for an answer. I think that the first no is fine and I respect the no, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to make an end run around you and go to the next resource or possible source. And I will exhaust everything within my power before I would give up on any of this. And fortunately, I had a great doctor. His name is John Cahill. And John was a humanitarian, along with being a brilliant diagnostician. Gratitude doesn't begin to describe what I feel for him. You know, a sad reality is that because dementia was historically not well-funded, Many researchers made other career decisions. The end result is today there's a dearth of qualified neurologists and month-long waits to be seen by experts really required to make an accurate diagnosis. Now, you've described yourself as a very deliberate woman. You vowed never to write a book, and I have referenced your opportunities. What about your experience with Lewy body dementia changed your mind? I said I would never write a book because when you're a publicist, and I being a classical music publicist, you're entrusted with the lives of the people you represent. And you know a lot. And you've been through a lot with these people. And I think it's a sacred trust. I don't believe in tell-alls. And so that's why I said I would never write a book. But just before Nikki died, in a lucid moment, he said to me, Mary Lou, you have to write. And I, I sort of went, okay, fine. And then I thought about it and I thought, well, write, write about what? And then Nikki died and I knew. I mean, Meryl, it was almost as if the light bulb went on in my head and I said, I know what I have to write about. I have to write about this journey of caregiving, which started when I was 10 years old because my my father at age 37 had a massive stroke, which should have taken his life, but he was strong and determined and he fought back and he lived, but he lived without speech. The speech centers, both the major center and the the alternate, were completely destroyed because he was misdiagnosed. And he was diagnosed as having dehydration of the system, and they fed him salt tablets. It was in the 1950s. They didn't know what they were looking at in a 37-year-old. Figured a stroke could never happen at that age, and indeed it did. So what this taught me was that caregiving has many faces. And it began at age 10 for my dad. It continued then through with the artists that I represented, because that's a form of caregiving. And then the ultimate was with Nikki. And what I learned 
I felt I had to share, not just about Lewy body, which is really important to me to get the word out that this exists and it is not Alzheimer's, and also about caregiving, to let caregivers know you are never alone. Because as you, I'm sure, know, as well as I, and so many people out there listening, there are moments when we feel like we are the only people on the planet walking this path alone. And you're not. Alzheimer's disease is often isolating due to behaviors that are either inappropriate, disruptive, and even threatening. In your book, written through the perspective of family members and friends, how important was the role they played? It was really, really important. Nikki and I made the decision together when he was diagnosed, and I talked to him about this at length. Let's tell people what you have. Let's not keep people in the dark. Because, you know, if you see behavior that's not 100% what you would have seen in the past, people are going to whisper behind your back. There's going to be gossip. All of that nonsense goes on. And I wanted to avoid that because I really feel that anybody who is dealing with a disease, any kind of a disease, but especially a brain disease, a neurodegenerative disease, needs to keep his dignity. And in order to keep dignity, people have to understand what's going on. Now, some are afraid of it and will leave. They'll go away. And God bless, I understand it. I don't particularly like it, but I understand it. Those who will stick with you will really be there for you. I would try to orchestrate very small gatherings like lunch for four of us. That was the largest of the gatherings because Nikki could focus on two other people and they on him. He could begin a sentence and not finish it. And that was okay. And I just let it be. Sometimes I would help in finishing it. Sometimes I wouldn't, depending on the energy level of what was going on. And I found that being open was the way to go, which is also why I wrote so openly about this. I write about some pretty gruesome moments, but I think it's important, Meryl. I think it is vital for us to come out front and tell it like it is. In part two of Breaking Through the Silence with Mary Lou Falcone, author of I Didn't See It Coming, Scenes of Love, Loss, and Lewy Body Dementia, she describes what prepared her for her caregiving role and candidly offers advice to other caregivers on intimate issues that rarely get discussed. That's it for this edition. I'm Meryl Comer. Thank you for brainstorming with us. Our team is on a mission to help you stay up with the latest scientific breakthroughs, from new therapies to technologies on early diagnosis and personal brain health advice from well-known experts using an equity lens that promotes brain health for all. Now, we'd like to hear what's on your mind. What are the topics and guests you'd like to hear featured on Brainstorm? Send your comments to brainstorm at usagainstalzheimers.org. Support for Brainstorm by Us Against Alzheimer's comes from Otsuka and Lundbeck. Subscribe to Brainstorm on your favorite podcast platform and join us on the first and third Tuesday of every month.